Glad to see everyone this morning. I hope that uh, everybody's doing well. And uh, uh, as Pastor just said, uh, praising God for how he has kept us uh, over the last year in the midst of a pandemic and all kinds of turmoil in the world. God has faithfully kept us and let us all praise him continually uh, for his faithfulness. Um, I'm going to continue our study in the book of Acts. Um, I'm going to be primarily in Acts chapter 11, uh, verses 1 through 18, and we're going to continue in our uh, study of uh, what unfolded uh, with uh, Cornelius and his family. And as you know uh, and have heard from Dustin and Minu the last couple of weeks, they have uh, elaborated on the story and explained kind of what, what happened with uh, Cornelius and his family. And uh, especially Minu touched on uh, different aspects of uh, chapter 10 and actually started in chapter 11 and discussed how uh, uh, opening the church to the Gentiles was a key t- turning point in church history. And, and actually, we are the Gentiles, so that is the reason why we are here today. If God didn't make that happen, we would not have been here today. Um, so, so that's um, then the reason that this whole passage is important is we have to consider whether we are making the mistakes that. Um, uh, can you all hear me? Oh, is that better? Thank you. Uh, uh, we have to consider whether we are making the same mistakes or in the same place that the first century church was at that time. So I'll get into that in a minute. So what happened in, uh, so I'm going to be in mostly in chapter 11. What happened is, so I hope everybody's now familiar with the story of Cornelius. So I, was, I wasn't going to rehash all the story itself. But so in chapter 11, what happens is uh, after Peter and he brought six brothers with him from Joppa, and he came back to uh, Jerusalem, but he had, Cornelius had asked him to stay with them for a few days, so he stayed with him and had fellowship with, uh, with the new converts there, right? They all got baptized. And so now Peter has come back to Jerusalem. He's having to defend to the church leaders in Jerusalem about what happened. Because he is having to explain not the fact that um, the Gentiles uh, converted, but their question was, how could you go in and eat with them? How could you go to their house? Because they viewed them as outsiders. They viewed them as unclean. And this should be very familiar with us. I'm going to be raising some very difficult topics this morning, so so just brace yourself. <laughs> so this should be very familiar with and to us as an Indian culture because for centuries or throughout the history of India, we had institutionalized the caste system, right? And so this, this is not a new thing, new way of thinking, because we were, um, as a culture, uh, institutionalized thinking that certain people are unclean or uncommon or not worthy of coming into our homes. And we all know this. Okay, it's, I know it's a big elephant in the room, but we all know this, right? We are used to thinking that certain people are not even worthy for us to eat, share a meal together. And when we go back to India, we go to the same mode, okay? And, I mean, that's not my topic, and I didn't plan to say that, but I'll just say this, that that is not how a Christian should think. Nobody is unworthy 
to share a meal with us, okay? We have to root out these sinful things, as Pastor Mathukuti said, mortify the unrighteous deeds from our lives. This is unrighteousness. If we think somebody is unworthy to sit with us and to enter into our homes and somebody has to stay outside, that is unrighteousness. That is not who we are as Christians. Whether you go to India, whether you go any corner of the world, nobody is unworthy to be the same as us. In God's eyes, everybody is the same. It doesn't matter how old our culture is. Okay? Culture is not as important as being living the principles of Christ. Okay, so anyway, so the apostles had the same mindset, and, and you can't really blame them because they were living the Old Testament principles. God himself had told them to separate themselves from the Gentiles. And we have taken this and thought that to mean it applies in a cultural context. That's a first mistake. Because what God was showing you as an example of the church, separation between his people and the world, from the church and the unbelieving people, right? So this is not meant to separate people from people. This God raised up Israel as an example of a chosen people to show later how the church will be a bride adorned, a watered garden, a, wall, a fenced garden that is separate from all things unclean. It's not about cultures or skin colors separating from each other. Okay? So this is the other thing we have to remove from our heart. This, what Israel did was living in obedience, but it's not the same to take that principle and say, this is an excuse for us to think we are better or separate from somebody else who is of a different skin color or of a different culture or anybody. Okay, if they're a human being, in God's eyes, they are worthy of the gospel. That means, well, I'll come back to that. Okay, so, as you can see, I'm in <laughs> um, fine shape today. So, so please bear with me. I'm not saying this to offend anybody, okay? But we have to talk about these things. And God has given a chance for us to discuss these things as we study the book of Acts. So I am standing here prayerfully because I was also praying that I don't want to say anything just because that's how I feel about something. I want God to speak through me. Okay, so, so please uh, bear with me. The, none of this is meant to offend anybody. Okay, I love all of you. And, and, but sometimes we have to discuss the truth. And... And that's all I'm planning to do. So anyway, so Peter is coming before the leaders and he's, and he's explaining. Um, and so they're questioning him, how could you even do this? And then Peter, he, it says, um, uh, verse 4, chapter 11, verse 4, Peter rehearsed the matter from the beginning and expounded it by order unto them. He had knew this was coming, so he practiced it and memorized it in his heart, and he, and he explained what happened to them. The one thing I wanted to touch on about what happened there that um, maybe Minu and Justin didn't uh, cover, um, is, and it, as it applies to what I'm speaking about, is if you think about what happened, who was the apostle to the Gentiles? Anybody? Paul, right? So in... If we think about it in our human way, who should have preached to Cornelius? Paul, right? Because if Paul is the apostle of the Gentiles, when then why did God not have Paul preach to Cornelius? That would have fit. Sometimes we think this is how things should go. Our whole life is planned out. Man, A, A leads to B, then leads to C. We're good. This is exactly how things should go. But we sometimes find that's not how God had planned things. That is not the ordinance of God, right? So was it convenient for Paul to preach to Cornelius? Absolutely. If you look at chapter 9, Paul was actually in Caesarea, 
where Cornelius was. Read chapter 9. says that Paul was in Caesarea, and then he went to Tarshish. Okay? And because they, uh, they had helped him escape, I think he was in Damascus, they helped him escape and brought him to Caesarea because all the people were getting stirred up that Paul was converted and he was preaching to the Grecians. So he was easily able to preach to Cornelius. But God, that was not God's plan. That convenience is not a reason to do things. Okay? Remember that. Convenience is not a reason that we follow and obey, obey God's commandments. It's not about convenience. It's not because we think that something is the way it should be done. It's not just because of circumstance. It's not how God works many times. Okay? So we've got to remember that. So God called Peter all the way from Joppa, which was, I looked it up, it's about 35 miles away, and 35 miles is not the same today as it was then. Right? They had to travel by foot, or, or through a you know, uh, or different carriage, right? Animal-drawn carriage. So it's not the same. So he had to come over a period of two or three days. To, so God went out of his way to bring Peter to preach to Cornelius. Okay? So the one message you can take from that is what we think, you know, happens in our life is not by accident. Okay? Just because things look impossible in your life, whatever situation you're in, God has a plan for each one of you, okay? It might take time to work something out. It might look impossible, but you are not an accident. No, not a single person is by accident. So it means that just, just like this story, God has a plan for each one of you, and we have to wait for his time. And you know why? So this is, there are a couple of reasons why I realize why this happened. Um, if you remember back in Matthew chapter 16, Jesus made a proclamation to Peter. He said, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. Okay? And, the, the, uh, and God was fulfilling that promise many years later. That Peter was the one who preached on the day of Pentecost, and the church was established among the Jews. And Peter was the foundation that was laid to bring the first Gentile to Christ. This was God fulfilling his promise. So nothing happens by accident. God will make happen what he has ordained. Amen? You all with me? What a great God we serve, right? So nothing happens by accident. So the second reason that I believe that this happened was because Peter needed a transformation in this area. Okay? Imagine if Paul had brought Cornelius, they would immediately thought, oh, yeah, look at that guy. He came an outsider. He was a persecutor. Now he's doing all these things on his own, going away from the Old Testament way. But Peter is the foundation or the key member of the church in Jerusalem. He needed a transformation in how he viewed the gospel. That the gospel is now open to anybody that is willing to believe in Jesus Christ. And he saw with his own eyes, and he said to the leaders there, the, I saw the Holy Spirit was poured out upon the Gentiles. And I, by this I know, God does not hold back his Holy Spirit from anybody who believes in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? You all with me? That is why we are here. God poured out his Holy Spirit on us. Because we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. So because of that, we know there is no difference between anybody that is willing to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so he needed a transformation in this area. His heart needed to be changed because God showed him the perfect vision, right? There were all kinds of creeping and crawling four-footed animals coming down on that sheet. It could have been viewed as very offensive. Like, I can't imagine being amongst these people. I can't imagine that I, a Jew, will even interact with these people. This is the same way we think sometimes. How can I interact or be a share of pew with these people? 
How can they be a member of our church? These are unclean people. This is what God wanted Peter to be transformed from. This heart change is what God wanted Peter in his heart. Because that was what God designed for his church. So now think about where we are at as a church. Okay, so I said I'm going to ask some tough questions. Uh, so think about how we, and this is not just, again, this is not just about racism. Um, it is about racism, but it's not just about that. But it's also about what we, what, what we envision a church should be. Okay, look at about our church. Uh, I'm talking about our Indian churches or any churches, right? Um, we like to control the outcome. We like to make sure everything in our life is laid out in a certain way. And we want to control whether it's church or anything else. So we want to control how the church is run. Okay? And so we decide that certain way is how the church should be run. But that might not be how God has designed his church to be. The church was not designed to be run by, uh, by the congregation. The church was not designed to be run by administrators. The church was run, de uh, designed to be run by the Holy Spirit. Okay, so, and why am I saying this? I'm not asking this so that we can, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, just to kind of stir stuff up. Okay, I'm asking this because are we hindering the work of the Holy Spirit because we said church has to be this way. We want to create a bubble so that our children will be protected from these unclean things. We want a bubble so that we have a big fence around our church so that nothing can go wrong in my family and my generations will have a secure place they can come and worship. Is a fenced city what God wants our church to be? Is the question. If he had said that, would we have been in the faith? Did we deserve to be in a church if God, that was the design of God, is my question. It's culture is important, traditions are important, we value those things, and, and I understand and appreciate that. But when we encroach on God's design for the church, we are walking dangerously. And again, I'm not saying we have to do X or Y, but it's time for us to ask God to transform us, just like he transformed Peter. That we, I mean, we are at a point in the church, um, or we have to ask ourselves, is our church growing? Do we care about the, the things? Are we caring about the right things? Are we caring about preserving this community of Indian believers because we want this community preserved, or we care about the church functioning as God designed it to be? These are the tough questions we have to ask ourselves. Okay? And that's just like if, if you had a pipe, right? Um, and I'll ask the worship team to come forward. I'll just take a couple more minutes. Um, if you had a pipe, and if you pour water down the pipe, if there's a blockage, the water will not come out on the other side. You with me? The same way the Holy Spirit, if you create walls, the Holy Spirit needs to flow freely in our lives. The Holy Spirit needs to flow freely in our church. It is not just about Pentecost. Pentecost, so Peter needed a Pentecost for the Holy Spirit to fall on him. But he needed a transformation that happened at Cornelius' house. We need our meetings and where the Holy Spirit is manifesting. All those things that are wonderful. But we also need to be transformed. And the Spirit has to flow freely in our midst. And for that, the church has to function as God designed it to be. Not how we want it to be. You all with me? I know you might be a little bit mad at me. Uh, which is fine. That's okay. Um, um, hopefully you'll get over it. <laughs> uh, but... But my point is, is the church functioning as God designed it to be? Um, about, uh, let me think about this. Let me do the math. 20, 30 years ago, um, there was a, 
uh, famous speech that most of our, a lot of our famous uh, favorite president said, and he was in West, uh, Ronald Reagan, he was in West Berlin, and this was before the fall of Soviet Union, and Mikhail Gorbachev was sitting there, it was a joint summit, and he was sitting in Berlin in front of the Berlin Wall, and um, the Soviet Union had created this wall to preserve communism, right? To create this bubble where they, didn't, they wanted their way of thinking to be preserved. And they made these physical walls to prevent the flow of people so that they can prevent the flow of ideas, the free flow of ideas. They didn't want democracy flowing into communist countries. So they made these, erected this wall in Berlin which was kind of the, uh, the kind of the flashpoint of where, you know, uh, between East and West Germany, where that was a flashpoint of where communism was meeting and split that country of Germany uh, into two. And so Ronald Reagan, has, he went against his advisors and, um, and he said something in that speech, which is still famous today, and he looked at, Mr., uh, at Gorbachev and said, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. How many of you heard that speech? Some of the older ones might have. Remember that. Tear down this wall. And two years later, the wall fell down. Okay? So I'm asking you, let's tear down these walls that we have created in the church that the Spirit of God may flow freely. The ideas of God may flow freely no matter what the cost that we personally have to pay. Okay? Because... As long as God is in control, we have nothing to be afraid of. We don't have to worry about our children. Did, did our children, are they secure because we did something? Or is it God's protection? We don't have to worry about uh, uh, what's going to happen to us. As long as God is in control, we do not need to worry. But let us tear down the walls that we have erected. In how the church is run in how we think about other people, in how we view other communities, let's tear down all these walls and have a transformed life just like Peter. He was a, just a poor fisherman. And he, um, and, and he you, I don't blame him for the, how he thought or, and his actions. He was just a poor fisherman. But when the Spirit of God came upon him and he allowed the Spirit of God to move Freely in his life, he was able to be used mightily. Let us have our children be raised up to be sent to places that they have never been sent before with the gospel of Christ. Let us have our people be sent out from our churches to plant churches that God may work freely through our church. May his name be glorified.